please open your scripture to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we're looking forward to being in a passage of scripture that is instructive and informative uh, for believers. And I think every believer ought to really have a good grasp of this portion of this letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, this, as we have been preaching through 1 Corinthians, this portion of the scripture really addresses a lot of problems that the church had. And as I study different churches in the New Testament, one of the things that I'm reminded about is how much teaching and how much access this church at Corinth had, even in comparison with other churches. The Apostle Paul would have been with them for a couple of years, along with the team that traveled with him, about seven or so folks, and taught them. And it's one, it was the one place where Paul really didn't undergo a lot of persecution. It's the one place where he had peace in, in the ministry and uh, really is a place of healing for Paul. And it's a little a bit of a striking contrast to me to read the letter he writes back to this church that he had such a tremendous personal experience with that now has so many problems. He begins, first of all, with the problem of the believers following different personalities. And meanwhile, some of those personalities saying, I'm following Jesus. While they rejected Paul and accepted Apollos, or while they accepted Apollos and and rejected Paul, or while they accepted Cephas, or while they rejected all the apostles and said, I only follow Jesus, I listen to no man. The thing they were forgetting was that God, uh, God's son Christ, had appointed the apostles. And to reject an apostle was to reject Jesus. And you know, uh, that's a problem in the church, and the, the diagnostic for the problem, the, the source of the problem, wasn't that one of the individuals was right, or that, uh, that Paul and Peter or Apollos were on different teams. The source of the problem was diagnosed as a lack of spirituality. They were not spiritual. In chapter 2 of uh, 1 Corinthians, we see that verse that's so often used in the context of unbelievers, where it talks about the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God because of foolishness unto him, and neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet himself is judged of no man. And it's talking about Christians, about believers who are so unspiritual that they lack discernment, and they think they're so smart because, well, you know, you know, Apollos, I mean, he just speaks with such, you know, his language and his demeanor and his behavior is so much better. And I just, you know, I just think Apollos is the right one. Well, you know, Paul, he's the one that really, you know, can articulate doctrine and bring uh, together the, the law and the gospel and explain it. Well, you know, Peter's the one that really has zeal. You know, he's the only one. And the fact of the matter is when you look at men that way, you're not looking at Jesus. When you look at men that way and you follow one as though you're opposed to another, my friend, you're not spiritual, you're carnal, you're babes. And so Paul diagnosed that. Then he dealt with sin in the church. Of course, the terrible sin where a man had taken his father's wife. And Paul really uh, just emphasized that if the church didn't deal with that sin, he'd come and deal with it himself. And so he taught church discipline there. Also talked about uh, people in the church and their testimony to the lost. Brothers taking brothers uh, before the law, before unjustified or unjust judges. And forgetting that they themselves would one day with Christ judge the world. And why would a person who's going to judge the world put himself under the judgment of an unjustified or unjust judge? And that was a problem in the church. Beginning in chapter 5 also, Paul really began to deal with the problem of fornication. Fornication, if you study it in the Scripture, is always, interestingly enough, connected with idolatry. And I think this series, as we're studying through it, and as... I was just doing some Bible searches in, in a Bible works program, just asking for words that had related context. Uh, it's very, very interesting that the two words that were most, that, or the, on, the word that was the most connected with fornication was the word idolatry. And the first mention of fornication in the Scripture is also a mention of idolatry as well back in, uh, in the Old Testament of the Scripture. And so it's important for us to recognize the dangers of it. And you study the Scripture carefully, you'll find that fornication is dealt with continuously from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 10. Even while some other topics are interspersed, it all comes back to fornication and idolatry. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's mentioned more in that portion of the Scripture than it is anywhere else, although the word fornication, the word that we get pornography from, is used uh, many places in the Scripture, mostly in the New Testament, but some in the Old as well. One of the things that we saw was that uh, this is a portion of Scripture that deals by far the most with it, and it was a problem. My friend, is it not a problem today? Is it not? Uh, listen, there's nothing new under the sun, and God is way ahead of the times. You know, it's, it's incredible. You know, years ago, when I used to read Leviticus, 
And I'd read things and I'd think, people don't do that. And today they do. Today they do. And I'm sure they always have. Sin isn't new. The devil, uh, the devil hasn't come up with anything lately. But it's amazing how that God's Word is so ahead of the time. It's a reminder to us to always be biblically relevant and not culturally relevant. Because God is way more relevant. You know, you and I can be really with it for about, oh, I don't know, how long, how long can a person manage to stay cool? What, about four years or so? Something like that. And then, you know, I mean, if you try to, if you try to pretend that you're cool past 18 years old, my friend, the people that are under 18 will know you're a fraud and a phony. And so the reality of it is that, <laughs> is that you, that's, that's an attempt in futility. And when the church tries it, it's really a comedy actually when the work, church tries to keep up the, with the world when the Bible says to love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the Father is not in him we don't need to be relevant to the world we need to be relevant to the scripture and God my friend was relevant thousands of years ago and he'll be relevant when we no longer are at all relevant so it's a good reminder about that as well and then we moved into of course the danger uh, first, of, uh, first of all of uh, of uh, men and women being distinct and then also the danger of taking the Lord's Supper and doing it in, a, in such a way as it became, well, it became all the variations or the different ways that it was done wrongly. And primarily the one Paul focused on was that the church was uh, taking the Lord's Supper like a dinner. They were, they were going to eat the Lord's Supper. And in, in eating, everybody, you know, tries to get the biggest chicken wing, you know. Uh, they make sure that they, they, they take before the other. In other words, I hope you don't take that slice of pie. You ever see, I, I've never seen an evenly sliced pie. Now, that only happens in math class. But in reality, I've never seen an evenly sliced pie. And when I see someone cut a pie, instantly I see the piece I want. Don't you? Anybody here? I mean, it's, it's a little sliver because I know if I eat more than just a sliver, then I won't be able to eat the other six kinds of pie. So, no, not really. <laughs> I want the biggest piece. I want the tallest, the thickest, the best piece. By the way, uh, this pie, Lee, that you found to put on this flyer, this is, this is um, it's a crime, actually. It ought to be real. You shouldn't have to look at something like that and not be allowed to eat it. But it looks really good. And uh, I don't want to get off on, I'm not sure how you end up talking about pie, but we're talking about the Lord's Supper. And Paul's conclusion about the Lord's Supper was that as a result of individuals partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthily, some people in the church were sick and some had slept. That is, they were dead. And so it was a big deal. Then we moved into the portion that we're in right now, and this portion is dealing with spiritual gifts, the importance of spiritual gifts. The purpose of spiritual gifts, Paul explains, is for the edification of the body. It's to build up the body. And we're reminded that a body is not made up of individual pieces. It's made up of members. And it's important for believers to understand the importance of membership, that is, belonging as a member of the body. And every member of the body is very, very important, whether you be a hand or a foot or an eye or an ear or, or a head or a, uh, whatever the body part that you are. And it's important for every person to know his place. Last week, we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we saw that none of the spiritual gifts that are described in chapter 12 have any value unless, first of all, there is the greatest thing that God prefers, which is charity, love of the brethren. And we saw the importance of that. Now, this evening, if you'll permit, I'd just like to read a couple of verses. And uh, I want to just read verses 1 and 2, and then if you'll permit me, chapter 20. I have about four sermons I'd like to preach this evening. I summarized you know, most of the 1 Corinthians already, but that's, not, that's only our introduction to get to reading the text tonight. My apologies for that. I'll try to speak faster. I'm thinking about going back to the days when I used to talk so quickly that people couldn't keep up with me. And I, I listened to myself the other day on YouTube, and I realized I can't, I can't think as slowly as I speak anymore. And so I need to speed things up a little bit so maybe we can get some more done with less time, and you'll make better use of your time this evening. If you don't like it, um, well, come tell me about it, and I'll apologize. Verse 1, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Will you please pay careful attention to verse 20? I do want to this evening get to that place, and hopefully it will be a help to us. Verse 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding, be men. Let me read that again. Let me all memorize that verse. 
I have not, but it's on my list right now. This is a good one, isn't it? This reminds me of when Paul tells the church at Rome to be wise concerning good and simple concerning evil. Right? Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be ye men. Father, please help us this evening as we look at this matter of maturity and uh, how it relates to spiritual gifts. And I pray that you grant us good understanding and practical use of the things we learned tonight in a way that we could edify the body in a way that, Lord, we would not only be instructed, but we could instruct others as well. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, this evening, of course, there's a lot that's covered, and we began talking about spiritual gifts a couple of weeks ago. And I wish, actually, that I had about a couple of months of all the messages uh, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, to really cover the matter of spiritual gifts. Because, friend, one, there, 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 this is one of the areas in uh, church doctrine or church teaching where there is just such a grand imbalance. And we always talk about it, don't we? We always talk about, oh, this is an area where we're out of balance. But practically speaking, we really are. The truth of the matter is because of what some individuals are wrong about, individuals not being wanting to be on that side of the spectrum have really swung the, all the way to the other side and are on the opposite end of the pendulum to where either the, the spiritual gifts are overemphasized or emphasized wrongfully to the degree that others react by saying, we're not having any part of spiritual gifts because they're so wrong. You ever seen somebody be so wrong about something that someone else just rejects the thing entirely? I have, I guess I'm getting old. I guess I'm getting old enough that I have seen enough trends come and trends go that I've just seen so many times where somebody's wrong about something and somebody just just goes nuts they just go bonkers the other direction about it and as believers we really need to be balanced um, the reproach that we ought to suffer ought to be for the sake of the gospel and for our identity with the Lord Jesus Christ not just because we're out of whack not just because we're wacky let me help you with something I haven't mentioned this in a while, but I found it to be very true. Have you ever noticed a lot of Christians are weird? How many of y'all know some weird believers? Just oddball Christians. I used to be baffled by that. You know, for a while I thought, when I was a youth, I thought, you know, maybe there's a requirement if I'm going to serve the Lord that I've got to like drive a really, really ugly 15-passenger van. It's got to be rotted out, and I have to uh, have like 10 children who all have nasal accents. And, uh, you know, and my wife has to... Um, you know, wear a sack and have a bun on her head with a pencil stuck through it. You know, I, <laughs> now I'm sorry to be so descriptive to you this evening, but the fact is, is that, you know, it, it just seems like some people are just different. I mean, they're just, and I understand being a peculiar people, being distinct and set apart and, and so forth, but I just met Christians. I'm just like, you're just weird. And you know, I figured it out after a while. I figured out that God saves weird people. <laughs> And uh, there's an old saying an old preacher used to say. He said, either, either everyone's normal or no one is. He said, either everyone's normal or none, or either we're all normal or no one is. And I think that that bears out pretty well, pretty true. So I've learned just to embrace it, you know. Uh, you're weird before you're saved. You're probably weird after you're saved. But it has nothing to do with the gospel and its effect. But Christians can get wacky. They can just get out of sync, can't they? by just being reactive to, oh, that's so wrong, and they just whoo, go all the way over here, and they're just way on the other opposite end of the spectrum, and they're imbalanced. And we as believers ought to really be concerned not with being relevant, not looking the way that the world wants to see us, but we ought to be concerned with just really uh, being balanced as believers. And the matter of spiritual gifts is an area of imbalance, isn't it so? You ever go to a church, and I mean, they will not speak, uh, they, they will not speak about anything without... Uh, delineating between the three persons of God. It's Father God this, Father God this, that, uh, Jesus, Jesus God, Jesus God, Holy Spirit, and it's as though God isn't one person. He's three in one, my friend. And uh, some individuals just get out of whack uh, with regard to the person of the Holy Spirit in particular, and they just want to talk only about the person of the Holy Spirit. And now, listen, my friend, I hope you know the Holy Spirit of God. See, He is to us, if you study the Scripture carefully, He is the representation of Christ. He's Christ in us. He it is who Jesus was referring to when He said, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. And uh, He talked about the Father will send another comforter. What is that another comforter? Well, that another of the same kind is signifies that He literally is Christ in us. I love the song, Christ liveth in me. 
Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. He lives in me, and the Holy Spirit of God represents Christ. He's a representative for Christ. Of course, He has other ministries with us, and we know, I think, some of those ministries, the sealing ministry. Uh, but what we're speaking of specifically this evening is the empowering ministry of the Holy Ghost. We're talking about spiritual gifts. We're talking about the, the manifestation of the Spirit so that the church can profit or be built up. The word edify is a word that is a building term. It's like laying bricks. Uh, Brother John's an engineer, and he's a brick guy, and he knows about building up the building. And uh, oi kata main, I build up the house, or I build up the building. And it's uh, edify is a word that talks about building up, not tearing down the building, but building the building up. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is given, gives gifts to individuals to profit by. And I think we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, if not, I intended to, and either didn't have time or maybe didn't as much as I wished to. I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that a believer when he is supernaturally gifted by the Holy Ghost, it is different than a personal talent. You ever, um, you ever been a little bit troubled by uh, individuals teaching about the ministry of the Holy Ghost and then they give a test like that is a, uh, an aptitude test, like what you would take to uh, go into the military or to apply for a job for a large company and they're trying to figure out what your, you know, your personality traits are, what your strengths and weaknesses are. And I remember some years ago, and hasn't for a while, probably because I've been pastor of this church since the beginning, and I've never allowed it, but I remember being in Sunday school classes where they talk about the gifts of the Spirit, and they give you an aptitude test to find out whether you're, you have the gift of mercy or the gift of giving or the gift of helps or whether you're a gift of teacher, whether you're a gifted teacher and so forth. But what they were evaluating was not a supernatural gift. They were evaluating a natural gift. You ever heard somebody say this? You know, he got saved. Ever heard that before? Man, I'll tell you, if he got saved, boy, he could use that voice for the Lord. Man, if he got saved, I'll tell you, with those finances that he has, boy, he could give to the Lord. Man, if he got saved, with his, with his personality, he would just be a natural teacher. Well, I am here this evening to inform you from the Word of God that a spiritual gift is not something... I'm not saying it is a conflict with what your natural gift is, but I'm saying to you it's a supernatural gift. Uh, I'm most impressed when God does something through me that I know I could not have done without Him. You ever just, just come to the place where you've just realized that self-reliance was an attempt in futility? And you just had to say, God, without you I can do nothing, really. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I don't know... I don't know the, the right words to say, God, you're just going to have to give me words. And God does. You ever had that happen? You ever realized, I can't convince? I can't, I can't do this? You ever had a task that was just, just, you know, you realize the task is way larger than I am. I cannot do it. I can't complete it. And you just had to just fall back and just say, God, I don't need your help. I need you to do it. And then God does it with you, and you're looking at your hands, and you're like, these hands? You're listening to your voice, and you're saying, my words? No way. That's when the Holy Spirit of God, uh, when He works through you, and that's supernatural. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are supernatural. They're important. Okay, so now I want to just look this evening and, uh, at uh, the, the topic that's introduced. Boy, am I uh, taking way too long. I'll speak faster. All right. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Paul urges the church, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. And then there's a contrast, a contrastive phrase. He said, but rather that ye may prophesy. So Paul has just emphasized the importance of charity. And talked about the futility of spiritual gifts without charity. And now he said, follow after charity. But then there's an emphasis here. And he said, but if you're going to desire spiritual gifts, desire to prophesy. And now he's going to get specific about what he's talking about by specifying the problem that was happening in the church. And that is that individuals were infatuated with the uh, self-aggrandizement or with the uh, experience themselves of speaking in, in unknown languages or tongues. And really the way that that they felt about it themselves. In verse 2 he says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue uh, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit, 
He speaketh mysteries. And then in contrast to that, verse 3, he said, But he that prophesieth uh, speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. If you'll permit this evening, I'd like to look at what the Scripture here is focusing on because here Paul is suggesting, or not suggesting, he is commanding that we emphasize uh, the gift of prophesying over the gift of of speaking in tongues. Now, it uh, goes without saying this evening we ought to have some definition, shouldn't we, for prophesying? Uh, what is prophecy? What does the word prophecy literally mean? Actually, in this context, Paul uses some Old Testament uh, allusions or references to the gift of the prophet in the Old Testament. I will remind you that if you were to study Ephesians carefully and look at how the church is made up or built up, you will see uh, that the, the structure of the church is Jesus Christ is a cornerstone. If you're a building, you understand. This is Pythagorean, 3, 4, 5. You start from the corner, you go 3 this way, 4 this way, whatever increments or measurements you prefer to use, and then the, the distance from the 3 this way and the 4 this way will be 5 from here to here, diagonally across. That's the uh, Pythagorean theorem in practical use. And so if you want to square something and you want it to be perfectly square, that's the method that you would use. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Any building can be square if you have a point that you begin from. And without Jesus Christ being the cornerstone of the church, the building's all out of whack. And you have to have the person of Christ right. It has to be who Jesus is, not who you think He is or who a denomination has defined Him as in their creed or their confession. It's Christ as He is. And so Jesus is the cornerstone, but then the Bible says the foundation of the church is the apostles and prophets. Now when Paul penned those letters to the church at Ephesus, when he penned those letters, Paul was an apostle, was he not? And so when he talked about apostles, he knew that he was talking about something that ultimately would be a cessation gift. He ultimately knew that there wouldn't always be apostles, but it's interesting when you read the letters of the New Testament, every one of the apostles knew what they were penning that, was, that it was supernaturally inspired by the Holy Ghost, that it was literally God-given, given by inspiration of God. And so when, they, when Paul would write these things, like what he's writing to the church, he's fully aware that the apostles are becoming permanent as the Word of God. And when the Scripture refers to the, the category of apostles and prophets, it is not speaking of Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles. It's talking about the Word of God. That's the foundation of the church. That took me a little while of explaining to get there. But Jesus is the cornerstone and the foundation, the footer, that the church is built on is the apostles and prophets. And then the Bible says that we as members are fitly framed together. In other words, we fit into the building. So in Corinthians, Paul describes the church as a body. In Ephesians, Paul describes the church as a building. And it's the way that it's all made up with the different members. And of course, members would be the emphasis in those things. Now, Paul is saying to build up the church, excuse me, to build up the church, we need to emphasize in the church prophecy over the gift of tongues. And, and there's some explanation uh, for that. Let's look at verses 7 through 10, and we'll just let the scripture define tongues or de uh, describe yeah, tongues by itself. In verse 7, the Bible says, um, even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? So we see here in our definition for tongues that a tongue is a distinct sound. Whereas it has a distinct sound. If you, if you are a, a brass aficionado, did I say that word right? Or did I just make up a pronunciation for it? If you like brass instruments, you probably might know the difference between a trumpet and a trombone or between a saxophone and a tuba. Uh, they do have distinct sounds, don't they? A French horn and a euphonium. And uh, you know, now that's probably a little bit of a stretch for me. You know, I, the, the cornet and uh, trumpet for me, I don't know the difference. You know, but there are, if, you know, if you know what the sound of a trumpet is, and you know the sound of a cornet, if you're better than I am with those things, you know the difference, don't you? And I'm sorry to insult some of you uh, more finely cultured individuals than myself this evening, but just because I know something, don't know something, doesn't mean that, the, that it cannot be known. And Paul's point here this evening is that an instrument that makes a sound, it doesn't give an uncertain sound. It isn't, what is that? Uh, now, I've heard some, <laughs> some folks learning to play, I've heard some bad instruments, where he said, well, what is that? Uh, and, and, and I know my wife is thinking of Bella right now, taking her, what is it, the um, flutophone. Uh, and, and just being very, very offended that we would not let her play in church in Miami Beach and, then, and playing Name That Tune with us. 
actually. And they definitely were they definitely were uncertain sounds and how in the world a person could ever know what it was that it signified. If you were witnesses of this, you know. <laughs> but the fact is, is that uh, an instrument has a sound and it is readily identifiable. If I clang cymbals together or if I bang on a drum, you know what they are, don't you? Instruments have certain sounds, whether it be a pipe or a harp. Now, does a pipe sound anything like a harp? No, not, not in the least. And, and verse 7 says, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Does that make sense? So we're talking about tongues. We're using the pipe and the harp to identify tongues. And what Paul is defining first of all for tongues is that what he means when he's talking about tongues are distinct. Distinct words. Distinct sounds. You get that? In other words, it's not incoherent babbling. If you have ever uh, wasted the time listening to people who are purporting to speak in tongues, you'll recognize the same phrases over and over and over and over and over again and the same style of speaking over and over and over again, you realize they're not... Now, now, sometimes you say, sometimes I think that's the devil speaking through them. And I acknowledge that, that that could be true in some instances. But when individuals pretend to be speaking in tongues most of the time, if you listen to it carefully, if you're a linguist at all, you know it's not a language at all. It's just uh, a, a, an arrangement of vowels and consonants done over and over again in a certain, uh, certain repetitious way. And if you listen to the same person doing it different times, it's just the same thing over and over again. It's not a distinct sound. Uh, not just like words are. And then in verse 8, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Now, for those military individuals here this evening, you'd know what's being talked about, wouldn't you? You know what reveille is. You know what... Uh, -do 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 -do. What do we say after that? I think that's what that means, right? Okay, so that gives us a little bit of an illustration. In other words, when the trumpet sounds a certain way, it has a meaning, doesn't it? Don't just go and... and uh, the, the trumpeter just starts blasting off and just making noise. No, it isn't what happens at all. That's what I do. That isn't what somebody is when they're trying to communicate something. That's just blasting off, right? Now, so then verse 9 uh, and 10 help us complete the understanding. So likewise. Okay, so Paul explains here. I'm giving a like illustration. Except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood... How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Now this evening, I, I uh, want to inform you that I am speaking in tongue, in a tongue, and I want to say that it is correct American English for the most part, except for where I've deviated somewhat by either making up words tonight or using bad grammar. But the tongue that I'm using, I think that most of us would agree here this evening, unless you're just so much better than me, that we're using American English. Isn't it so? In other words, it is distinct from other English, but you, if you were to listen to me this evening, you'd say, yes, Pastor Price is speaking American English. He uh, sounds a little bit Southern with it, so that's a sign that he hung out in the, the lower Alabama regions where no one should ever go and was badly harmed and influenced by that uh, portion of his life. But, but overall, he's a good Midwestern. He means well, you know. <laughs> so, so likewise, ye... Except, hate on Alabama whenever you get a chance, by the way, folks. It's just, it ought to be done, uh, especially if Angela's going to go there tomorrow. In verse 9, So likewise ye accept ye utter by tongue, the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall be known when it's spoken? For ye shall speak in the air, and truly the southerners you can't understand. Now verse 10, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, notice this, and none of them is without Signification. Have you ever listened to a language and you can kind of understand what they're talking about? Uh, some languages that you listen to, it's as though I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know what's being said. You know, when you go like this and like that, that's about all I understand. You know, I think they're about to eat me or something. That's all I know. But I don't know what's actually being said. But the, but Paul here gives the exp explanation. He said just like. A, a, a trumpet or a harp has a significant sound. You know what it is and what it means, what, it's, what, the, what the notes are. There are many different kinds of languages in the, in the world, but all of them have meaning. And so Paul here is defining, if you will, for our context in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he is defining that tongues used in context here are languages that have actual meaning. Well, can we agree on that from the Scripture tonight? Is that plainly laid out here in the Word of God? Now, this is not intended to be controversial. I, I just love it that the Scripture gives so much detail so we can be settled about a matter. So before we...
look at the advantage of prophecy. Oh, we're really uh, not doing well for a time. I want to just look at the advantage of prophecy. Let's rattle off some. First of all, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So why should a person covet prophecy rather than tongues? Well, because a person that speaks in a tongue does it, and they, they get whatever feeling they get from the experience of doing it. And the fact is, is that, I'll be honest with you, I'd probably stay up late this evening to be able to speak fluent Swahili. In other words, if by supernatural means I were able to speak with a person who is fluent in Swahili, Charlie, are you there yet? Can you speak quiet? You're still, you are a slacker. Uh, if, if I had this evening someone who spoke fluent Swahili, I'd stay up till midnight to talk to them supernaturally and in, in their native tongue, wouldn't you? Uh, this, this corroborates Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the supernatural gift of tongues, where Parthians, Medes, Persians, Elamites, and so forth all heard the apostles speak in their own language wherein they were born. And their conclusion was these guys are drunk. But normally people don't become more intelligent when they're drunk. Peter pointed that out before he preached the gospel to them in their own language. But so we understand this evening then, don't we, that to speak in tongues is to speak supernaturally in a way that edifies. It's not just for the experience of the person, it's for the person to hear. And truly, truly the audience was edified on the day of Pentecost when the gospel was preached in different languages. Was it not so? Yes, because uh, uh, thousands were added to the church right then at that moment. Right. Now, uh, the second purpose that we see advantage of tongues, and by the way, these are I'm not pulling out everything that could be here in the Scripture tonight, but this is an overview. Verse 5 uh, is that uh, the advantage of prophecy is that it's greater than tongues because of its scope of influence. Verse 5, the Bible says there are differences in administrations I actually should read verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administration. Oh, no wonder it doesn't say what it's supposed to. I'm reading ch verse chapter 12, and I'm like, this is not right. <clears throat> verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. And here what we find, described if you read, if, if you read the context, is that when individuals would speak with tongues, they would be prophesying, and if they had an interpreter, then the message that they received was a prophetic message. It was a, it was a thus saith the Lord kind of a message to the church, and the church benefited by it. Now, there are some rules for prophecy and uh, for, for tongues. We might not get to those tonight. Verse 6, clarity was another advantage of prophecy. Clarity. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine. So the question is, what's the profit of it? Well, we want to be clear about what's being said. The purpose of tongues is not to babble or to confuse. The purpose of tongues is not to impress people. Look at me, I'm having a spiritual, supernatural experience. And, you know, I am not the, the judge of any person's heart. I cannot look into somebody and know what the heart's motive is. All I can see are the outward behaviors, and I can know what the behaviors are, and I can't correctly diagnose, right? A sin, sin, and but certain behaviors are right, certain behaviors are wrong. I've been in churches where uh, tongues are purported to have been spoken in, and when I watch the behavior of the people there, I recognize that oftentimes it is a self-seeking attention getting uh, way that it's delivered. You say, Pastor, it's very judgmental of you to say that. I know it is. It really is very judgmental of me to say that, and that's what I've judged it to be. Okay, so that that's just a fact. Moving forward then, uh, another advantage of prophecy, verse 22. It's a sign. Uh, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. And here I think if a person were to carefully compare Scripture with Scripture, the conclusion that we would hear and draw is that oftentimes the gift of tongues was used to communicate across language barriers. That seems to be supported, of course, by the Pentecost experience. And it seems as though if a person's an unbeliever and a person whom they know cannot communicate with them somehow communicates with them spiritual truths, it validates the spiritual truth because of the supernatural form of communication. In other words, in your own language, they're saying, God is saying this to you, and you know that the person could not say it because they cannot even speak your language. 
And so an unbeliever would have to say, okay, there's something to that. And isn't that what the result was on the day of Pentecost? The message pricked their hearts. But the fact that they heard the message, people had to say, well, there's something going on here. There's something valid. There is something to that. And so that, again, would be an advantage of prophecy. Uh, and, and I'd like to look at uh, the contrast between... Uh, no, I don't have time for that this evening. I'd like to draw some conclusions tonight, if you'll permit. Um, verse 13, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Okay, so how are we to respond to the matter of, of speaking in tongues? Well, our... Our response ought to be that a person who can speak in an unknown tongue ought to pray for clarity, or that it's more than just a language, but it is understanding that is given by the language. In other words, that his tongue would communicate. And in verse 14, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I'll pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing the understand, he understandeth not what thou sayest? I've done this. I've actually been guilty of this before. Have you ever been in a service where another language is being preached, and someone gets up and sings beautifully? in their language, and at the end you just feel like, wow, that was beautiful, and you just say amen, but you don't know what was said, actually. I did uh, Gu's wedding last year, and a, and a girl got up and preached, or she sang in Chinese, she preached, she sang in, in, uh, in uh, it was a Mandarin, or just Chinese, uh, she sang, and it was just beautiful. What she sang? 1 Corinthians 13, wasn't it? That's what she sang. I said amen to it, because I think I knew what she sang, uh, at least if they told me the truth about it, but it really was beautiful. And the truth of the matter is, is that honestly, for me to say amen or to say I am in agreement and uh, so be it, I really need to have the understanding. We have to be careful with our amens, by the way. We agree too rarely, don't we, amen? <laughs> okay, all right, moving forward. Uh, you can't get an amen out of this church for anything. All right, moving, moving on. Amen, let's get down with this, right? <laughs> uh, so interpreting is one of the purposes. Another purpose for tongues is teaching, verse 18 and 19. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Paul said five words. He could tweet. <laughs> five words. I mean, he could converse with our president. Oh, <laughs> he said, I'd rather speak five words that are known than 5,000 that are not. Well, if that's what Paul feels about it, and an individual that also said, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all, then I understand his perspective, don't you? That's what he's given. He's saying, this is the balance of it. This is how I want you to be with how you view tongues. Okay. Uh, and then he said there for a sign. Verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them which believe not, but for them which believe. And so he gives a little contrast. You know, tongues help unbelievers. Uh, prophesying helps believers. And uh, I guess it's because that tongues are more of a convincer. All right, I've lost everybody. I know you've all gone home already, at least in, in your minds. And so Amen. I'm fully aware. Amen. <laughs> All right, now we're getting some I can't believe Brother John's listening. Let's go back to preaching. All right. Um, so what's our philosophy live by? Brethren, be not children in understanding. Verse 20. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be ye men. Next week I'm going to talk about how to properly speak in tongues the Bible way. We're going to look at that. We have to finish that out in our context. But I really want to come full circle to where we began in our text this evening. I love the gentleness of the word brethren. Every time it's used in the Scripture, it's an inclusive term. It's, a, it's an inclusive term. It really is a fraternity, isn't it? Being one of the brethren. And I mean, it means brotherhood. It means being part of something, part of something special. I can't believe that individuals take 1 John, which is all about fellowship and written to brethren, and try to make it for the lost. It just, it's, it's just asinine. It's, it makes no sense at all. The reality of it is, is that this term brethren is a term of endearment. It's a very, very kind, gentle term. When you call somebody brother, you're saying, listen, it's not you against me. It's not I'm here, you're there. It's us together. 
It's a togetherness term. And I love the way that he begins the statement. He said, brethren, he's urging them. He said, come on, come on, guys, get your heads on straight. Think about this, would you? Listen to me. Apply what I'm saying here. He said, brethren, brethren, uh, be not children in understanding. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And that's true, isn't it? You know, sometimes an individual that maybe doesn't quite have the faculties that events or that, that, that show forth maturity uh, can, can be mature, can be wise. But Paul here is actually asking the church, okay, let's go ahead and let the, the sample be wise here. And he said, you know, brethren, he said, be, uh, be not children in understanding. Pastor, the whole tongues thing, I'll tell you, that's just too much for me. I just don't want to get into the debate of it. And I just, you know, I'll just be honest with you. I just don't understand it. I don't think I can understand it. I'm just not even going to try to understand it. Don't be a child. You know, he's saying, hey, grow up and deal with this. Grasp this truth. You know, sometimes you just have to just uh, go ahead and wake up and go ahead and focus mentally and get a grasp on some things. And he's saying, don't be childish. You ever met a person that's childish in logic and argument? You know, what do they say? Well, I'm just, it's just, I just, it's just so. I just, you say, well, you know, if that's true, then this is, well, I don't care. I just don't believe that. Well, it's, that's childish, isn't it? Paul's saying you need to be reasonable about this thing. Don't be children in your grasp or in your understanding. You need to grow up a little bit with this whole thing and the behaviors that are coming along with the abuses of, quote, speaking in tongues, or childish behaviors, actually. Uh, and now he goes on to say, and I love this, he said, How be it in malice be you children? Who had you rather plot your demise? Myself or Caleb? In other words, if somebody's going to take you out, don't worry about me, I've never taken anyone out. But I could. I <laughs> really uh, if, if somebody's going to be plotting against you, if they're going to do something evil to you or dangerous or, or deadly to you, uh, would you rather Caleb, he's almost three. Caleb's almost three. Would you rather a guy that's almost three try to take you out or me? I mean, he doesn't have a driver's license. He can't catch you walking into work and run you over. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, he doesn't, you know, he might think, I'm going to get him. And he can charge full steam ahead and hit you as hard as he can. And he might just about hit your kneecap and, you know, make you sorry, but he's probably not going to be able to do much to you, is he? I've never been threatened by a toddler. Have you looked to the word to hear child, little child? I've never had a little child be a real serious threat to me. Have you? I've been threatened by that. And uh, why is that funny? <laughs> Oh, yes. I've, well, I've had malice and a forethought from you as a child. That's, that's very true. That's true. He has, tried, he has tried to kill me, come to think of it. But I, I'd rather you tried to kill me uh, than Brother Charlie. You understand? Like he's, he's been a Marine, and he just thinks mean things. <laughs> you think mean things, but can't carry them out. Now we're getting a little bit silly about it, but the illustration here in the Scripture actually is incredibly practical, isn't it? I gotta watch him. He's still. You huh? better not grow up and get me. All right. I might have to take him out before he grows up. <laughs> uh, the reality of it is that Paul said, "I would have you with your maliciousness to be childish, but I would have you with your maturity uh, to be an adult. I would like you know with your force of your thinking." And uh, what Paul here is saying is, be really harmless. You as a believer need to be harmless, not harmful. You need not do damage. And uh, you just you just need to be kind of childish when when you're harmful. No more, you, where you couldn't do any more damage than a, a little boy that throws water on you or something like that. All right. Uh, was it water? It was water, wasn't it? Good thing I don't have a memory because I'd, I'd remember. And I'd take you out when you get to be my age. I'm always going to be my age, by the way. First 20, the second part. And then he said, but an understanding be you men. And here Paul is just telling the church to grow up. He said, you know, a lot of this is just a matter of maturity. A child needs attention. A child self-seeking. A child uh, is childish to, to want to have attention or to have things your way. 
but it is, but it's a mark of maturity when and you're more concerned about understanding and you're more concerned about uh, the whole picture, everything about it. Now, next week, we're going to look at this tongues matter a little bit further. But let me, let me conclude by saying a couple of things uh, that I have not said or that I am not saying. Uh, I am not invalidating the gift of tongues, nor am I saying that today uh, that tongues are not a cessation gift. I do believe that what Paul said when we looked at it in 1 Corinthians 13 last week is that there are certain things that cease. But I would never in any way limit God in His ability to do something. But tongues always had a purpose, didn't it? And the purpose of tongues was always edification. But the purpose that ought to be sought by any mature believer is not self-edification, which it seems apparent that in its context was really the abuse or misuse of tongues here. And instead, Paul said, prefer prophecy. Because you ought to want to hear meat or truth. It serves as a good illustration that individuals that want to talk about tongues with me, they don't very often want to discuss the Scripture. They want to discuss something supernatural that only they could know. But they don't want to discuss whether or not it corroborates the Scripture. And we'll see that one of the qualifications for tongues is that the prophecy of the Scripture and the legitimate prophets in the New Testament corroborated what was said. And I find that that oftentimes is just not so. I don't, uh, I don't keep records of it, but I have many times experienced that individuals have come to me with a word of knowledge, which not only contradicted the Scripture, but also which did not come true. And so Paul's emphasis is we're really, I wish I could conclude this evening, I feel really irresponsible beginning this message and not drawing its natural conclusions. You just have to be here next Wednesday night uh, to, to hear the rest of this and as we look at the proper use of tongues in the church. Paul's not limiting spiritual gifts. He's emphasizing the importance of the edification of the body. Anything which is done regarding spiritual gifts for personal benefit rather than the edification of the body <clears throat> seems to fly in the face of charity, seems to fly in the face of the purpose of spiritual gifts. And I'm reminded in conclusion this evening that you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your soul which are God's. Why does God supernaturally gift believers? To profit with all. That's what began our context, isn't it? In other words, God gifts me for your benefit. And God gifts you for our benefit. We're gifted for a purpose or for a reason. And you know, any mature believer would really sift everything they believe and every conclusion they draw and every way they practically apply the things they believe through that standard. It's to profit with all. It has to go through that filter. And you know that eliminates just about every abuse or misapplication of the Scripture in this context. And we'll finish seeing that next week. I apologize for not getting far enough this mm -hmm. evening. Father, we pray that you would grant to us further understanding, help us to grasp, know, and uh, desire really to have the maturity. Rather than being a child in understanding, help us to be a child in malice, but help us in our understanding to be men. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, if you have to slip out, I understand, but we're going to uh, go ahead and take some prayer requests at this time this evening. Uh, Sophia sent